I am so excited to be here because uh, this is my fourth in a series of talks about UX and open source. Uh, my first talk was back in uh, 2021, uh, remote, of course, uh, from a farm with chickens in the background. And if you actually listen to that recording, you'll actually hear the chickens in the background. And it's so nice to actually be here in person, finally. Um, but the whole idea about the, that first talk was to talk about my journey about as a UX designer trying to help open source projects and all the problems that I had. Uh, but the next year I said, well, let me try to be a little bit more proactive. Let's talk about some things that are tools for maintainers to actually attract and keep UX designers. So flip it around, talk about that. Um, and every time I gave a talk, people would ask questions, or this wouldn't work for me, or this doesn't work. I always got questions about why these things wouldn't work. So finally I said, given the fact that sometimes open source gets an, an unfortunate bad reputation for UX, and that, that can be a divisive thing to say. All I'm saying is that people outside sometimes will say that. I said, let's talk about the successes. So the last talk was all about the projects in open source that were very you know, well known, that great UX, like what's our Apple computer? You know, what are the things that we want to aspire to be like? And let's have a real positive spin on it. So I talked about those, and that went fairly well. Um, and that brings us to today. So I'm finally able to, to hopefully have this be my last talk on this, this theme here. Um, but why do I keep coming back? I keep coming back because I started in the 80s with corporate software. And believe it or not, we really didn't think we were evil back then. And we really were trying to do these right things. And I felt like actually corporate software was in a good spot. You can disagree with me, but it was like people were doing the right things for the right people. And then as late stage capitalism kicked in, um, it got a lot worse now. And it's really clear to me now that that's not working. And things like data privacy and data, sovereign, data sovereignty are obviously critical to everyone, and that's hard to do today, especially with these cloud-based services. And so just open source just feels like, to me, the only way forward for us to really build software correctly. And there's clearly a lot of uh, programmer-based software, low-level tools and compilers and tools, and, that, and that's fine. But there's a subset of open source that I would claim is meant for everyone, especially if you want people to get off corporate software. And I think it's a, it's a different shift to talk about tools for our community versus tools for the world. And so some projects just need what I'd call a stronger citizen focus. Not a consumer focus, but a citizen focus. And that's a different type of thinking because so many of OS tools are really programmer tools. And so we have to think more of in a citizen way. And this is obviously a very hard problem. So I'm not trying to wave a magic wand and say this is easy. But the key thing that's so hard for some people in open source to get is it's not about you, right? The whole purpose of UX is to focus on the not you, the person that is approaching your project for the first time. I, for example, I think the vast majority of open source projects really need to work on their onboarding, right? It's just hard to get that product in your hands and use it for that first time. And that's kind of why I'm here. I actually retired just recently, just a few weeks ago. And um, I want to be a part of this world. I want to give my time to open source. And I'm doing all these talks because I see these issues, and I want us to have a much more robust interaction where there's more cooperation, more respect, and more highly effective uses of UX in open source software. But it's not just me. If you've read anything about the demographics of our, our society, there is a huge junk pile of people my age coming into retirement. And so what I'm trying to do is to come up with a way for maintainers to actually take advantage of all these you know, people that are coming into the market. One of the number one things you hear about open source is we don't have enough people. Well, guess what? A whole bunch are coming your way, and wouldn't it be nice if you grabbed them? So that's what I'm trying to do here. Now, when I did this talk, I, I lost, a lot of times on Mastodon, I'll do some of my concepts in as small little posts just to get reactions. And this quote came up as I was talking about it. And it's from a, a well-known person in the open source community. And I, they could have meant it in a different way, so I don't want to use their name. I really respect this person, so I'm, I'm not trying to make fun of them. But it does represent, I think, a, a good faith effort that some people just believe this. Computer scientists make algorithms from mathematics, computer engineers make functionality from algorithms, and UX designs make features from functionality. This basic feeling of you just work down the pipe and UX comes at the end. I hate this with the heat of a thousand suns, okay? Um, and again, 
I'm not trying to make fun of this person. It's just this approach that kind of UX comes at the end. And if you go to any UX portal for open source and people are asking for help, 75% of the requests are for better pretty icons. <laughs> Drives me crazy, right? I mean, yes, you need icons, but like, we should be doing so much more than icons, right? And so the focus of UX, the whole point about UX is to ask this fundamental question, what do other people need? And how do we talk about that? How do we integrate into that to our flows? And by the way, this whole tension I've been talking about has nothing to do with FOSS. This is in corporate software too. And so I'm not trying to make this about FOSS. I'm just trying to say this has been a historical tension we've had with technology forever. And so let's not worry about whether this is a FOSS or not FOSS. This is, let's just get better at this general problem. But it is the elephant in the room. And I've had several less than savory comments made to me on social media. Um, but that's the 1%. And I don't want to worry about those people. Um, but it's also a structural problem because um, I used to be a consultant, so of course I always think in two-by-two two grids. Um, but if you were to th think of the world as devs and UX and internal versus external, and these are very soft, broad terms, the idea meaning that in a any kind of project community, you've got a few developers that are kind of on the inside, and whether they're paid or whether they're, they're just the key people, that's one thing or they're kind of more the broader community, you know, the kind of the people that are um, uh, contributing. And, but it's always this, whether it's 50-50 or 5-95, you know, doesn't really matter. The point is that there's this group of people on the inside and the outside, and it's a big community. UX is this little tiny cloud, okay, and it's way on the outside. There's nobody on the inside for UX. So all UX people are like, please, would you accept my idea? And there's nobody there. The idea goes and just lands on the ground, right? Because there's nobody on the inside to pick it up. So it, it almost feels like there's this party going on with the devs. They're having a great time. They have their cultures. They have their tools. They have their understandings. They have the cool kids. And we're like getting the side eye, like, who are you guys, right? <laughs> and the, the point of the story is there's this red line, culturally, socially, that we have to cross. How do we get UX across the line? How do we get more UX on the inside of a project to help understand and support and discuss this? And until we can cross that line, we'll always be outsiders trying to push ideas in. So fortunately though, of all this kind of preamble, it's doing really well. And these are some of the companies that I interviewed last year and talked about and got some really good ideas. And to summarize last year's talk, there were just three basic points that you create a shared plan that includes UX goals. You improve your onboarding because UX designers will often come to a page and go, where do I start? And then you build a culture that understands and appreciates these things. So watch last year's talk, but I, I talked about that a lot. But um, the whole point here is to avoid what I call design by PR. So much of UX design is kind of like, well, just, just do a PR and check it in, and then you're done. They're like individual little, it's like throwing a piece of putty on a statue. And you just throw it on, and eventually you just keep throwing pieces of putty on it, and eventually you get something that looks like a person. But it's not coherent, right? Each PR has nothing to do with the other PR. And the whole point of UX is often to be consistent, right, or coherent. And so the overall theme of the whole talk was UX is a team sport and just how, what that means and how that works. So, okay, interesting Scott, but the comment I got when I gave this talk last year was only big projects can do that. We can't do that, that's too hard. I'm like, okay, um, so that's where this whole talk came from, size matters. Is it true that only big projects can do UX properly? They've got paid people, they've got more money, bigger teams, it kind of makes sense, right? They do that. But then this year, I actually started helping out some small projects. I did a little project for Bonfire, the new uh, Mastodon client. I did some work with Flatpak. Tiny little teams, and it went great. They were not large projects, they were just little ones. Come in, have a little discussion, make a decision, have a plan. And I'm like, wow, this is going great. So it's like, what does this mean? I mean, like, does size matter? I mean, like, how can it be that these big projects can do it and these little projects are doing it? What does this mean? So here's this totally inaccurate official graph um, <laughs> where I talked about, like, what does this mean? Is it, is it really the case that we have only success on the small and the large and there's this big grate unwashed in the middle that has problems? And I'm trying to figure out, well, where is, so that's what I was trying to pull apart in this talk. And so 
the overall feeling that I kept getting when I talked to people on these projects is that UX is more work. And if there's one thing we know about most open source projects, they just don't have enough time. And I totally appreciate that. There's just too much to go around. And any time I come in and say, well, all you have to do is improve your onboarding, like, who's going to do that, right? So of course I get that. But I would claim it's not more work. It's more coordination. And if you can work on your coordination, you can get so much more. But then, of course, they'll say, uh, yeah, but isn't coordination work? <laughs> and I'm like, well, OK, yes, technically, that's true. But if a little effort brought in this wave of new people that could help you, wouldn't that be worth it? So a little bit, are you familiar with the whole hill climbing algorithm where you're on a hill and every direction that you go is, the, is down the wrong direction? But if you go down and you get up to a higher hill, so yes, everything I'm talking about sends you down the hill a little bit, but the idea is to get to a much higher point. So this is clearly a deep problem. And so I wanted to say, what, what is going on here? So I know. Time for some user testing, right? So as a UX designer, I started talking to people about what was going on with their mid-sized projects and why it wasn't working. So I heard three basic stories, and each one of these is reasons why it does not work, and I want to take each one of them apart. And so, by the way, I want to stress that this is an exploration. If you would prefer, this is a prototype. I am just trying to kind of talk through some of these ideas, and the goal is to have a conversation with the community about this. I am not trying to be an old white guy telling you what to do. These are just things that I learned, and let's just keep the conversation going. So scratch your own itch. The key problem here is that a UX designer will come in and like maybe start with an issue and say, um, the dialog boxes are inconsistent, and we need to make these changes, for example. And what will happen is the devs just won't pick up the UX work. The UX designer wants to do it, and they're like, uh, I'm busy. Sorry. And it, it, just, just like, it just hits the wall and it dies, right? And when you talk to the maintainer about it, they go, well, I can't ask. There's almost this kind of allergic reaction to giving people suggestions or things to do in open source because it's, an, it's, a, it's a community, right? And people do what they want to do. You know, scratch your own itch. And so it's this idea that, well, if they don't want to do it, I can't make them do it, right? And the issue I see is they see motive as something personal. And if you assume it's personal, you are powerless. That's absolutely true. So my first insight when I talk to them about it is to say, well, wait a second, so why are bigger teams able to do this, right? Are they ordering people around all the time? Well, they do have some paid people. They can do a little bit more ordering. But they're better at many things, right? Their documentation, they got testing, they got build systems. There's all sorts of stuff that they're doing. And I can guarantee you it's not all scratching itches, right? So what is happening here? Well, there's something to learn here because I believe they have transcended scratch your own itch, right? What they've done is they've cultivated a higher goal. They actually have plans. They say, this quarter, we're going to do this. And we want to release these things. And what motivates a developer more than scratching their own itch? Getting their PR accepted, right? And if they know that the project is working on these things, they know that their work will probably get in. And that's really a big motivation but it's part of this broader arc. So the intention is to create a new type of motivation, transcend scratch your own itch, and that comes effectively from, from planning. And it's a way of saying this is important to us. I believe it's a very underappreciated motivator. But let's be clear, there's a reason why this doesn't happen, right? Planning is really, really hard. And usually what people do is they'll plan the easy things, right? But what they won't do is they plan the hard things. So uh, years ago, I was working on a project with KiCad, and there was an issue they had with supporting older versions of the operating system. And it was a real big concern because it was slowing them down. They didn't want to do that, but it was holding back the UX and lots of other things. And the big concern was that if they dropped that, there would be a fork, right? I'm not trying to say there's a simple answer here, but if you really do want to solve this problem, you have to make some harder decisions. And that's unfortunately just an act of running a bigger project. You find, agree uh, you find agreement now, or you argue forever, right? And that's the, that, the, the dirty truth of planning, that you have to do some of this sometimes. Now, what am I, why is this? So I, the goal here is big companies can tackle this. They can do the big plans. You're a mid-sized project, so what do you do? Well, just do a little bit of planning, right? Just to do as little as you can to create a go set of goals that give you that extra motivation. I think that's an important step to do. So 
The next one I heard was just lurk and do a PR. Don't rock the boat team. Just, and by the way, every UX designer sees this one. And I'm just so tired of hearing about it. Don't rock the boat, learn. And then you do all of the work and you just do a little PR and then you, you, you check it in. And it's really a good idea, of course, because you don't want to just barge in and do stuff. But I tried this personally with Mastodon and other people have as well, which was just change an icon. With Mastodon, of course, I couldn't find the icons. So I looked at them and they said, oh, we're using a, an icon font. God, icon fonts are such a bad idea. But I was like, okay, fine, you're using icon fonts. Okay, well, oh, by the way, but we're doing React. So it's actually not in this method, it's in an after method. So, you know, you just kind of have to build the whole project. I'm like, I didn't check in any icon changes, right? So the, the issue here is that um, software has just gotten so much more complex these days. Back when open source first got started, projects were tiny. They were just a couple of little files with a bat file and you would just run it and you could download the whole thing and just change the initialization file and do stuff. And I feel back then when software was so simple and light and easy, it was fairly easy for you to kind of um, just make these small changes and you could do your own little thing. Well, Obviously, they're more complex now. And so I just want the developers to understand that you just can't ask a UX designer these days to make a PR. Sometimes you can with documentation, so, but, but it's just a lot harder. And so what we need is someone across that red line, someone on the other side to say, help you get started. And it's everything from having like uh, hashtags on UX issues. Some people, have, some sites actually have hashtags for like for starter projects or even simply a simple readme, a UX readme file to say, if you're a UX designer, here's how we do things. Here's the stuff, and we'd love it if you took a look at this. Just having a single readme file would really help people a lot. Tiny bit of work. Now, that would be a quick fix, but the longer term solution here, of course, is to have somebody on the other side of that red line. That's what you really need to make this work better. And that's the longer term goal, is to have someone in your inner circle be a UX person to help you with that. So help the lurking a little bit. The final one was to bring in a UX designer, which you'd think would be the coolest thing ever. Someone brings in a full-time UX designer onto the project. And I talked to a particular ma manager who did it, and it broke my heart because this guy brought one in and he said, okay, we're gonna do a, a design system. Months worth of work, did all sorts of stuff, was building, died, and he quit. <laughs> and that happens in open source. It happens in open source a lot. And so this poor maintainer was like, well, I think we really still need the UX designer. So he found another one. I'm like, good for you. And the new designer was like, I don't like any of what that guy did, and started all over again. I mean, honestly, both UX designers were at fault. Right, and just like there's bad programmers, there's bad UX designers. We're not all angels here, right? And I felt so bad that he got two bad ones in a row. That was just really bad luck. But there is a point where we should say that the maintainer should not be looking at the UX designer as a savior or as a black box. That you just hand everything over to the, you need to be part of that team. So the issue here is to say, don't throw things away and break up your UX deliverables. And you don't, it's better for the maintainer to have a little bit of UX experience, but you can actually ask the UX person to help you with that, and that's very important to do. And so I've talked to other people who have major projects, have a person, and when they have contributors come in with a UX idea, that the first thing they say is, make it smaller. Just always say, make it smaller, so that you can kind of land a smaller piece of that. And so I kind of got break it up into smaller bricks, bricks and have them work on it one at a time. But here's the thing, when that brick is done, not only do you check it in, but you celebrate it. You tell the team about it. You say, look, it's awesome. We landed this little piece. This will allow us to do the next piece. And the key part about that is that you socialize that. The rest of the development team sees what's happening and they know it's been accepted. And so you're building a kind of a an understanding of these bricks to the rest of the team. So it's, it's two pieces, smaller pieces and celebrated pieces. They go hand in hand. And then of course, if someone leaves, those bricks stay. You don't throw it all away because the new guy can't come in and say, I don't like it because the rest of the team likes it. It's already done. So UX culture is more circular 
and of course, design by PR is more linear. And the idea is that you kind of spiral your way up. So let's say you want to make dialog boxes more consistent, right? You first you do the study, you then kind of have some suggested ways of improving it, you then work on each individual dialog box, and you just work your way up. So you don't do all the dialog boxes at once, you do it as a, in a piece by piece process. This takes experience, and if you have no UX background, I can totally see this would be hard for you, but talk to the UX designer and they will work with you and help. So, um, and you have to, so the other one is to, like I said, I already talked about this, land each piece and do it. Um, so the astute of you will realize that what I just talked you through was the exact same outline of last year's talk. Uh, create a shared plan, do a little planning. Improve onboarding, help people work a little bit. Build a UX culture, get some team buy-in on these little bricks. So yes, the big projects do this in a big way, but my point is middle-sized projects can do it in a little way, and you can get off that little hill and get onto a bigger one. And so it's not rocket science. And these are all stories I heard that you couldn't do it, and what I'm trying to say is you can. You can do a little bit of it, and you have little pieces of it. So that's what I'm trying to do. Start with baby steps, and that will help. And the more you do these things, the more you build up your culture, the more you build up your vocabulary, you get more confidence in UX, uh, people trust each other more, and it just, it just keeps layering up and layering up. You can do that. So the goal for here, I'm almost done, isn't to get you to do more work. But the goal here is to bring in more people. And all these things I just told you, these little baby steps, are ways to bring in people like me who are retiring and to get the people that you need to help. So I hope that can work for you. And clearly, it's working bigger for these bigger companies. But how do you get started? I want to leave you with just reach out to a UX person. If you don't feel comfortable with it, talk to them and use the terms I used here making things smaller, bringing them in, landing them, you know, talking about the various aspects of it. Ask them to help you. They can help you do that and break it up a little bit. Start with that. But there's actually a, uh, a UX uh, help group right upstairs that's working right now. They're here to help you as well. So please go see them. And you don't need to bring in a person full time. I do this actually, what I'm doing right now is actually UX consulting for open source projects. I'll meet with a team for just one or two meetings get you grounded, help you ask a couple of questions, and I'll, I'll leave you to it. So you're more than welcome to reach out to me as well, if you'd like, but I'm not here to push me. And besides, I'm free. I'm not going to make any money on this. The, the point is all UX people are happy to do this, most likely, right? So don't, uh, the, the point is reach out, ask for the help, and break this down, and it'll make your life just so much easier. So I just want to say thank you very much. Here's my contact details, and I want to have this be a conversation. So if you have any questions, let me know. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Any questions? Yes, I see. I think we have like, what, four minutes left? Hi, um, thanks for the great talk. So I'm a project lead for an open source project, kind of mid-size. Uh, we've had a UX person step up and say, hey, I want to do stuff. We've got a company who's funding them for six months. Oh, that's fantastic. Broken it down into small bricks. We now have like 40 PRs in the queue and our core team are getting really, really annoyed because there's so many really small PRs that it's like obscuring the landscape of all the other really important stuff that needs to get done. Yeah. So I wonder if you've got any tips for how to balance that when you're starting this kind of project. We've done lots of, they understand why it's needed, but it's just the extra workload that that is actually creating by having lots of small PRs that can easily be reviewed. Right. Any thoughts on that? Well, I would go back to this idea of a plan Right, these, if all these PRs are kind of unrelated, then I think you have an issue. But if all these PRs are related to a common goal, then I think you'd just say, well, we're trying to do X, and these 40 PRs are all in a way of doing that. Would it be helpful to break these 40 PRs up and say four groups of 10? <laughs> you know, so that you can say, um, and by the way, it's possible that you have too many PRs. <laughs> so all I'm saying is go back to your plan and make sure that your plan is agreed to by everybody and everybody's motivated by that plan. And then the, hopefully the, the argument then is that these all PRs make sense. But there's always that pragmatic issue though of at what cost? And that's where planning is hard. And I can't give you a magic answer for that one because if you do have too many things, you have too many things and you might have to go back to 20 of them. So th that's the harder question. But so it's a combination of having the right amount of work and having a better plan so people can see why you're doing it. Sorry, it's not an obvious answer, 
But those two things, I believe, are what you have to kind of work between, those two issues. Okay. Anyone? Any more questions from the audience? And if you do think of a question later, please reach out to me. I mean, I'm happy to talk afterwards. Okay, don't see any more questions. Thank you very much. Sure. Big, okay. Thanks, big clap.